Hey, let's talk about the fossil Pokemon. Yeah, that'd be a fun series. I haven't finished the Eevee series, but starting things is easy. Finishing them is hard. Good old Lexapro. Today, let's take a gander at the fossil Pokemon from the ancient times, the 90s, back when save symbols were still a physical thing and Pokemon only had one generation. What are the Gen 1 fossil Pokemon based on? What other elements are added into their designs? And what can they teach us about real fossils? Well, let's start with good ol' Lord Helix himself. Ammonite! Seems simple at first. Ammonite is based on the similarly named Ammonite, one of the most common fossils the world over, and probably the most common marine fossil ever. They lived during the Devonian period, long before life had appeared on land, and they continued existing way through to the Cretaceous period, so from about 409 million years ago, all the way to about 66 million years ago, when they finally went extinct, thank God! This huge window of existence gave them them a lot of leeway to evolve many variations of their basic body plan, which is why there are so many fossils of them. They are often referred to as an index fossil, which means that if you can identify which specific one you are looking at, you can figure out the relative age of the rocks and the other fossils around them before you even get to carbon dating or any other chemical means. There's a reason why Ammonite and Amistar are the first on this list and one of the first three fossil mon released ever. I mean, they're based on the most common fossil. That just makes sense. And this is also why Ammonite is a fossil Pokemon specifically and not just a normal Pokemon based on the extinct thing. There are plenty of Pokemon based on dinosaurs and extinct animals that aren't Fossilmon, so clearly there's more to what makes a Fossilmon worthy of being a Fossilmon. And in this case, it's not just because all Ammonites are extinct, but because their extinction and fossilization are just that important to our understanding of fossilization as a whole, and how the ocean used to be back before life on land. Fun fact, back in medieval England, they thought that Ammonites were snakes that died curled up and then were magically turned into stone. Monks and merchants would fashion heads on where they thought the head should have been on the aforementioned serpent stones. In Germany, they were called dragon stones, and farmers placed them in empty pails to magically spur cows into producing milk. It didn't work! Now, Ammonite itself appears to be based more on the earlier Ammonites from before the Cretaceous, because its shell is very coiled, and a lot of Ammonites of the later periods started to have more uncoiled shells, such as the Australiceras, and some were even weirder, like the Didymoceras Nebraskans. And as for Amastar, its evolution, it now has a beak, like modern cephalopods. Ammonites didn't really have beaks, they had jaws, in which the lower jaw was more than twice as long as the upper, and it seemed that the upper jaw might have been slightly more flexible than its counterpart, though that kind of thing can be hard to tell when the fossil you're dealing with is more than 50 million years old. Also, there were plenty of spiky ammonites, such as the Discoshophites and the entire Joletskites genus. In general, there seemed to be more spiky boys during the Cretaceous, which means that Amistar, being the later evolution, makes even more sense, and I love that! Leave it to Lord Helix to be amazing. I also love how serious this museum seems to be about keeping its fossils safe. Some fossils are incredibly valuable and are targets for museum theft. Or also just kids wanting to touch them and then they knock the stand over and they're fossils so they're fragile. Uh, but it looks like this museum doesn't have to worry about that because they are protecting this Helix fossil with a Helix mattress today's sponsor. Do you ever wake up feeling like your bones have turned into rocks, like a fossil? Then maybe it's time for a new mattress, hmm? I've had my Helix mattress for like three years now, and I still love it! N no, really. I love this mattress. Now, because everybody sleeps a bit differently, they have a sleep quiz on their site where they will match you or you and a partner with the perfect mattress. It's sort of like a dating app. And then the mattress arrives all vacuum sealed in a box so it isn't difficult to move around. Admittedly, getting a mail order mattress may seem a bit daunting at first. How will you know if you'll get along with it without trying it? Well, thankfully you can sleep with your Helix mattress for 100 nights to see if you really match up. And if not, no worries, they'll give you a full refund and pick it up for you. And if you love it like I loved mine, well, well you keep it. That's how, that, that's how buying things works. But right now, if you order, you'll also get two free pillows and up to $200 off by using my link in the description, helixsleep.com slash Loxton. They are very soft and smooth.
almost like a baby. So that was weird. Uh, but also, maybe your cat will love the box as much as mine did. My sleep and comfort has definitely improved, and yours probably will too. And if such a comfortable mattress surpasses the needs of my human skeleton, then surely it's good enough for these fictional fossilized animal skeletons. C. And next up we have this cute little guy that I hated as a kid because I didn't understand it. It's Kabuto. Are these its eyes? Are these its eyes? If these are its eyes, then what are these? The heck? Kabuto is based both on the extinct trilobites and the modern day horseshoe crab, which is considered a living fossil by many of us today. Here's a fun fact for you though, trilobites and horseshoe crabs aren't even all that closely related. Horseshoe crabs are actually, phylogenetically speaking, arachnids. Trilobites and horseshoe crabs are both in the same phylum, arthropoda, but that's where the relationship ends. Their similarity in looks is due to convergent evolution, which is when two distantly related living creatures independently evolved to look or act similar due to similar environmental pressures. And even though they have crab in their name, horseshoe crabs aren't even crabs either! I just hate when colloquialism and nomenclature don't line up! I also struggle with phone calls. Trilobites, just like ammonites, are another index fossil. There's just so stinking many of them. It's a super common fossil, which makes it a very fitting partner fossil, Mon. Kabuto's name is derived from Kabutogani, which is the Japanese word for horseshoe crab, and Kabuto is also the name of samurai helmets, which often look similar to horseshoe crabs in the most basic of senses, like this one, if you only focus on the upper half. Yeah, this little dude seems to be more horseshoe crab-like and only tangentially trilobite but if you look at its evolution, Kabutops. Whoa, look at this sharp, spiky boy! They've got curved swords. Well, they're more like scythes, since it's an ancient scyther after all, hence its shiny color being the exact color as regular scyther. But hey, that's just a theory! But still, compared to Kabuto, this guy is both way spikier and has way more in-depth design origin. First, it now looks way more trilobite and less horseshoe crabby, and has a few more fossily origins beyond just trilobite. Trilobites. To start, let's look at the name for inspiration. Kabuto, we already know from the first evolution, but this tops. The tops part is interesting. It could mean that the helmet is now just on its head and no longer basically its entire body. Kabutops is topped with a Kabuto, but I think it's a bit deeper than that. Tops may also be referring to triops, which are small crustaceans and are another type of living fossil. These little dudes look very similar to Kabutops' head, and if we look even closer, we see two long caudal extensions coming out of the triops' tail, which we could easily say translate very well to Kabutops' scythe handarm things. And back to trilobites, it looks a lot like Chirurus, a genus of trilobite. It's got the weird rib-looking bits sticking out of its back, and its head also has two bits aiming backwards. And we could also say that the scythe looks like both the head protrusions and the two-ended tail. Chirurus are the Latin words for hand and tail, after all, which is kind of a silly name for a fossil, like, Hello! I am Hand Tail! Nice to meet ya! And also, then maybe it's not a coincidence that they moved this creature spiky tail to Kabutops' hands, essentially. Hand tail. Uh, so yeah, that's gotta be all there is, right? A scythe-handed horseshoe crab trilobite triops? Well, maybe, but also, given its basic body plan and its propensity for eating meat and the fact that it swims, it is also probably based on Eurypterids, which were a very successful group of arthropods that started out swimming in the ocean and were carnivorous. Some of them, like the Megalograptus, used their highly specialized forward-facing appendages to hunt their prey. Sound familiar? Eurypterids were also often bigger than a lot of the fish around them. Much like how Kabutops is over four feet tall and weighs almost 90 pounds, which is quite big for a non-ginormous Pokémon, especially since most of the things it's based on are... minuscule. Not to mention Eurypterids were long thought to be the ancestors to horseshoe crabs, though more modern analysis says that they are more closely related to other non-horseshoe crabs arachnids. Ooh, and, 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 Eurypterids eventually evolved to be able to breathe air for short periods of time, to be able to be on land for a bit. Much like how Kabutops, according to the Pokedex, is apparently evolving from being a water dweller to living on land, as evident from the beginnings of change in its gills and legs. <laughs> And now, onto the third and final Fossilmon of Gen 1. Aerodactyl. It has several unique factors about it amongst the group known as the fossils. 
meta-wise anyway, up until Sword and Shield's abominations, it was the only fossil mon that is just it. No evolutions. And it's the only fossil mon that can mega evolve, and rather than coming from a literal fossil, it comes from the DNA trapped in amber. Just like the dinosaur DNA in Jurassic Park, which really is the main inspiration for the whole fossil Pokemon gimmick. The original Jurassic Park was a major international blockbuster back when Gen 1 Pokemon games were being designed, and both Gen 1 Pokemon and Jurassic Park feature bringing dinosaurs back from the dead from their fossils and DNA. But anyway, Aerodactyl's name is, obviously, a combination of Aero, the Latin word for wind, and Pterodactyl. Its Japanese name is literally just Terra from pterodactyl, but funnily enough, uh, terra is just finger in Latin. Ah oh yes, my favorite pet, it's finger. It's named this way because its wings are just extremely webbed hands, clearly. Aerodactyl looks like a pterosaur of some sort, but it has a wyvern head. But what's a pterosaur, you ask? Well, not a dinosaur, that's for sure. What? Yep, that's right. Pterodactyls aren't even dinosaurs. They branched off from dinosaurs way before dinosaurs were even really a thing. To simplify it extremely, pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and crocodilians are the main three groups of archosaurs, at least for our particular intents and purposes. So yeah, from now on, you can shove that in the face of every kid and or aging relative that tells you that their favorite dinosaur is a pterodactyl. You could be that guy! Pterosaurs were the earliest known vertebrates to evolve flight, and they were also very prolific and were anywhere from really, really tiny, like a neurogonathids, which were only a few inches in wingspan, to mind-bogglingly massive, like the Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsigopteryx, which each had wingspans of 10 to 12 meters. And those are conservative estimates, so based more on feelings. But needless to say, those last two are the biggest animals to ever fly. But what pterosaur is Aerodactyl closest to? Well, it seems to most closely resemble Romferhinkids, a group of early pterosaurs that evolved long before Pterodactylus. I say they're similar due to their wing shape and the fact that they have sharp teeth that protrude from their mouths and the fact that they were known for having a long tail, and that they are very comparably sized. But also, as I mentioned before, Aerodactyl is also reminiscent of a wyvern, or a dragon. It's its tail, head shape, and wings. Also, the Japanese word for pterosaur literally translates to dragon wing. And here's a fun fact for you. The pterosaur genus, Aerodactylus, was actually literally named after Aerodactyl, and was confirmed as such by those who named it. Though there are some paleontologists who dispute it as being its own thing. It might not deserve its own genus. It might just be a kind of Pterodactyl. But that's besides the point. But I'm down for more Pokemon names based on Pokemon. <laughs> Like Pikachurin, we did a video about that like forever ago. Check it here. Uh, subscribe to be notified of when we put out our next fossil video. And until next time, you never stop using your noggin.